All right, please be seated. Thank you. So this is actually what our private conversation looks like because I always ask questions. <laughs> That's the truth. I always ask him questions. Now, I post to thank you so much for honoring this meeting and um, for pouring out your heart. It's been amazing watching you talk the way you've been talking. And um, now, something shifted. I've asked you this privately about CCI in 2020. Um, I want you to describe that season and the things you personally did to maximize the shift. Thank you, Apostle. First and foremost, I think you need to really appreciate your set man for this because, yes, let me say this to you. The things I shared today are some of the great secrets of our ministry, if you call it that. I have never shared them on any public platform, and I may never do it again. Right? So, um, um, so, do with that information what you want. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, so, in 2020, first and foremost, I, I had a spiritual encounter October 2019. I was, I was in a fast, studying, and then all of a sudden, I looked up and I saw fire like two pillars of fire and I looked again, they turned to angels I looked again, they turned to pillars of fire and then the Lord said I am about to expand your ministry and you will no longer have the luxury of ministering to people individually all the time and so these angels, it was later I connected from the scriptures that he makes his angels spirits and ministers flames of fire angels and ministers are the same thing ministering spirits, you know so um, he said these angels will follow you anytime you're preaching. They would um, run through the crowd and minister to people as though you were ministering to them personally. So there was that supernatural encounter. It was so tangible. I was in Abuja at the time. I visited Lagos for um, a conference. I told last minute, I said, book a flight. I'm coming for a conference we called Supply of the Spirit. And that's where I noticed the shift, that my life had shifted and God was preparing me. And that's why I want to reiterate that as much as we emphasize on what I call right use of means. It must all come from a transformative experience and an encounter with God. You must have like um, a supernatural endorsement behind everything. And then the Lord now told us that 2019 reboot camp, the theme will be, what's it again? New normal, thank you. The theme will be new normal. And some of the things we're confessing um, in the name of Jesus, I'm saved from the plagues of Egypt and all of that. And we're just talking about supernatural advantage above sickness and all of that. And by January 2020, new normal was the most Googled phrase because COVID had hit. Um, and so the Lord prepared us for that season and all of that, the teaching of the word, the emphasis. And when there was a lockdown, it helped us in a remarkable way. I don't know why, in fact, if not for compassion for people who couldn't go out, I would say that's the best season of our ministry ever because we had the same impact. Everybody was tuning online and yet we're not paying rent because I was streaming from my house. You know, and we found a way to make sure that the experience was as um, efficacious as, you know. I, I want to say this. For every church leader listening to me, Put in the effort to make sure that your live stream is as rich as possible. So now in our church, you may or may not do this, depending on what you can afford for now. We have a separate mixer and a separate mix for online. You know, we try to make it as realistic as possible. Do you understand? So it's to work on the, the live stream experience and everything. And even during the lockdown, we got producers in different parts of the world, you know, to do songs, Zoom style. Zoom style, you know, and so praise, we still had praise and worship, we still had all those things. And it was a great experience. We were able to save up a lot of money. And now, people who had been following our ministries but were in different parts of the world where we didn't have branches, now that we were online, they could come again. So we had a lot of new following, a lot of new disciples. Let me surprise you all. By March 2020, our church had 1,000 subscribers. 1,000, and if you know, 1,000 on YouTube. 
March 2020. You know, so it was from there it began to take off and then we used the season we thought, you know, we knew that that season was for us. So the moment the lockdown was lifted like this, we planted four churches that year and that was where, you know, the shift started. By March 2020, we had two branches. We, had tw we have 26 now. So, yes, that's it. By March 2020, you had just two branches? Yes, and 900 members. Now, it <laughs> Last reboot camp was your 10th year anniversary. So, yeah. in eight years of ministry, you had two branches. We had two branches. Was that deliberate? It, it was as much as we could do. <laughs> uh, it was as much as we could do. And but within the space of three years, you have 21 new branches. No, um, 20, 24. 24 new branches. That's like opening six branches per year. More Maybe than. more, more. About yeah. eight. Uh, what's the number? Eight per year. About eight per year, yes. We've, we've planted 16 this year. 16 this year, 2023. Now, I know that you have branches in countries you've never been before. Yes, I've, I've never been to Canada. We have two branches there, and we have about a thousand members. In Canada? Yes. And we have never sent them a dime. Self-sponsored? Self yes. So the moment we said we are starting a church in Canada, all the, the disciples who had been following us there came together, gave money, they got a venue, they got everything. So meaning that the way those disciples got to know about the ministry mostly was online? Online. Now, did you create a system where the people scattered across board online would now be placed in um, cell structures based on the location so that you can maximize that harvest? So the humbling thing is, even if that's a great idea, we yeah. didn't do it. So in some places, and that's the thing about creating a strong maybe doctrinal identity and a strong church culture. So when these people found themselves in those regions, they started gathering on their own. So for instance, we, we have um, something that happened in Ireland, Ireland United Kingdom. Uh, the people who follow our ministry, they formed a WhatsApp group on their own. I didn't know about it. And then they started meeting in a living room to watch, to stream services, after a while, the living room couldn't take them, so they moved to a cinema on their own. Wow. Yes, on their own. And they started streaming. You know, it's, and they've done that for a year. In fact, uh, that, and they, then they reached out to us to say, please, can you open an account for us? We want to give. Wow. And I can tell you <laughs> for sure, you know, and when I, when I look at their giving, their generosity, everything, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible, you know, how far faithful preaching can, can take. So now we are just starting their branch for them first Sunday in November. After more than one year of them meeting on their own. On their own. No pastor. Now, uh, uh, so let, let me just give an advice about something you have said. There's a part of don't try this at home there. Exactly. <laughs> right? exactly. Because this is the move of the spirit. Oh, yes. Yes. Now, there must be a prayer culture, both personal and corporate, that sponsors this. Can you just give us a, an hint about that? So I'm not really one to <laughs> you know, talk about prayer, but um, as a ministry, we pray 6 a.m., 12 noon, 8 p.m., and 2 a.m. 2 a.m. for? Every day. Every day, yes. Together. Together. Come again. And we pray 6 a.m., 12 noon, 8 p.m., and 2 a.m. And we've done that since 2014. Also. Keeping those prayer watches? Yes, 2014. And people join? People join in their numbers. Because I, I, while we were in service, they were having fasting and prayer meeting yesterday. I was also checking. I saw that there were over 2,000 people online. Yes, and that's an unusually low number. So like something must have happened. So something must have happened. Yes, <laughs> that's an unusually low number. 
Now, Apostle, so keeping a prayer watch since 2014, that's nine years. So it means that people... So, oh, sorry, 20, 2013, because it's 10 years. We've been doing it for 10 years. 10 years, those prayer watches. Now, the, the things happening around the world about CCI definitely can be tied to a very formidable prayer structure. Amongst other things. Yes, and I think honestly, in humility, a sovereign decision of God by election to work with us to emphasize something in our generation. So I, I can tell you, I, I pray, but I never really attach it to the prayer. Because, I mean, there are people who pray, do you, you understand? So I think there is also a part of the calling and abiding in your calling and all of that. And just maximizing what God has given to you. I think I would like us to pay attention to the heart behind that statement. It's the heart behind it. It's deeper than you can think. Now, if, if I may ask a few more questions. I observed that you guys have a minimum standard that you uphold before you commence any new center. And now, most of these halls, all of these halls are expensive. The amount you pay per service, why is that? Then, if, you, if I may ask, how do you pay for all this expensive? What's uh, going on? Uh, thank you for asking that. And um, I just want to say that when you are doing ministry, there's the supernatural aspect and then there's the natural aspect. And whether you like it or not, you are dealing with humans. And so natural laws apply. Yes. So when you, are, when you look at all bank branches almost all over the world, you will never see a bank branch that you have to enter the street, turn right, turn left. It's always on the road. Yes. yes. And when you're looking at fuel stations, it's always, always on the, on the road. road. And I just, have, I just have a mentality that if these people can do that for money, I must do more for souls. And that's just, so I don't believe, in fact, I've told our workers, nobody who is working for money should work harder than us who are working for souls. Because by the, by the effort we make, people should be able to tell just by watching the worth that we've placed on one human soul. You know, so that's the mentality that we have. And also the Lord told us this. He says, they who have, more will be given. And those yes. who do not have, even what they have will be taken away. So many people think they don't have a good venue because they don't have money. But you don't have money because you don't have a good venue. Mm, 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 mm. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Many people think they don't have a good venue because they don't have money. Yes. But instead, they don't have money yes. because they don't have a good venue. Yes. So it's, it's, it's a law. And I think this is the first time I'm saying it publicly. And it's something I've tested again and again. I've tested it again and again. And, and it's just, you know, psychologically, when you want to give someone money, in split seconds, you size the person up. There's a reason you want to give a child money and you squeeze 500 naira. And you want to give an adult money, you squeeze. Ah. So, so the truth is, many church members don't even give based on what they think the ministry needs. They have a psychological assessment. Ah, how much is per? How much is how much is the venue? You know. So I've discovered that when um, the demand for the ministry arises, when when our evangelical vision gets greater, the same people give more. Wow! Because people don't really give. Because you say you need. They give based on their personal assessment of the sacrifice you are making for the spread of the message. So I've, just, wow. I've, I've just seen that time and again. That people will always rise to the occasion. Wow. But again, this is the pattern God has given us. Mm. <laughs> this is the pattern God has given us. Amazing. You, you said yesterday that this year alone you have invested over 3 billion naira in books. What kind of books? Uh, <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's a very good question. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm 
fascinated by theology. And in fact, yeah. um, I'm not, I've lost interest in even regular books where you just say prayer and you talk, 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 personal experiences. And there are very good books like that that I have more, much more than the average person of even those type of books. But I read theological materials. I read commentaries a lot. So I like to compare thoughts, read history, read St. Augustine, read all those old dead guys. <laughs> mm. All those Asians. You know, and, and it's very interesting. Like discovering a guy who interestingly, his name is like my name, Irenaeus. You know, an early church father. <laughs> you know, so I'm just fascinated with stuff like that. Um, so because I believe that I that one of the most important emphasis in this generation would be apologetics, learning to defend yeah. what you believe. Yes. What, how did you arrive at this conviction systematically? Because people are asking questions. You know, people are asking questions. So, so that's that's why I'm I'm do, I'm doing that. Wow, I noticed. I've never seen you 31st of December push out prophecy for the year for the nation. And I used to see some young boys just flood Facebook. What's happening? Why don't you do that? Or God doesn't speak to you about the nation, election, politics. So, so let me say this, if I may say so, and you don't have to agree with this. And the people who know, know. Celebration Church is one of the most prophetic ministries in the world. For instance, a lot of people say, why is it that God didn't tell any ministry about the lockdown? And I just told you that the camp meeting we had December 2019. The name was the new normal. That was the name of the camp meeting. And we were confessing every day that um, we are saved from the plagues of Egypt. We are saved from disease. That's what we're confessing. You know? So um, what the Lord tells me to push out, I push out. And usually the prophecies are for in-house. And those who hear, hear. For instance, I'm picking something. I believe that all things being equal, and let me say this, I can be wrong, but I doubt I, I am wrong. I believe that in 50 years, maximum, Jesus has come. 50 years. I believe that we don't have up to 50 years. Because all the, and this one, you know, when the Bible says, Daniel said he understood by books. So he just read and he saw that according to God's template, the prophets before said that when this happens, this happens, this happens, this will happen to God's people. So he began to pray, occasioned by what he had read. And just by studying, understanding what the mark of the beast is, understanding, you know, all the movies we read about rapture, uh, books we read about rapture, the movies we watch about rapture, most of them are wrong because the mark of the beast cannot be an ATM card. It cannot be. The mark of the beast has to be something that puts you in a position where you can no longer be saved. So the mark of the beast has to be something that is in variance to eternal life. Mm. It will come as a health solution or as a tech solution that makes you, offers you eternal life where you say, so why do I need Jesus? It's more like an implantation, a chip or something? Exactly. Okay. Or a robot in which you can transfer your consciousness and live forever. Depositing consciousness. Yes. So, and all those things are already been test from. So I know for a fact that we don't have much time. Jesus is coming. So, wow. but, but that message, until the Lord permits me, I mean, at Reboot Camp, we had a closed session. We didn't stream it. I saw you say that you pull it down. Yes, sir. I, I was. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. You know, you know, but I proved to them I have strong suspicion, you know, I don't want to say, it, of course, you know, <laughs> you know, but all the patterns are there. There's a famous man, one of the most famous men in the world right now. For Halloween last year, he dressed as Satan. And the, the inscription of Satan was on his chest and an upside down cross. And I think he was telling us something. You know, so I, I'm, I'm following all the patterns and I'm seeing it. They are, they, they've announced it, that that's what they're doing. You know, um, um, there's, there's an, a retired footballer 
who at UEFA Champions League award ceremony announced openly that, they are, that um, God doesn't care if we die. God kills us for sports, but science is about to fix that. And they are creating robots, and man will be eternal. He said it in an award ceremony. Wow. So it's an open secret among their circles. And so, but the church, our definition of prophecy is who will become the next governor, who is become, you know, and we are missing the big picture. In fact, I see that as a distraction. Yeah. Who will be the next billionaire and all those kind of things. You know, but when it comes to um, the main things, I believe that God has narrowed our prophetic focus to those things. Wow. All right. I, I, I don't want to, we can just be there all day. Let me ask the final question. When we look at your ministry, we can see vividly um, two men that, you know, you follow, Bishop David Oedepo, Reverend Chris Oyakilome. Can you run us through that? Okay, so Bishop Oedepo was my first pastor. I'm not um, one of the people who found out about him later. That was the church I was born into. Um, and I listened to him. I never missed a Sunday service because my parents never missed a service, Sunday service. You know, almost all my life until, until 2011. So from, from the time I remember my consciousness, from 93, you know, I was, I was, I was a member of the church. And, and I think that that ingratiated in me the spirit of faith in a raw, authentic fashion. So a lot of people encountered it at some point in ministry. But I grew up seeing it every yeah. day in such a way that I didn't know any other way. My first pastor had a private jet in 1995. So I, do, I don't know how to... So in fact, someone had to tell me, calm down. Because before, when I'm advising people, yeah, buy it now. <laughs> because... Oh, you want to do this too? I don't, I, mean, I don't know how to. So I had to come down to see that it's a function of the anointing and a strong mental model. That was my model. I remember I was just about six years old, climbing up to children's church and seeing um, signs and wonders, the newspaper of the ministry. They, they, they had the, the, the plan, the building plan for Canal Land. Wow. It was going to be five billion. I remember seeing, no, sorry, 25 billion or something like that. And I shook my head. I was, I was like, what kind of man is this? And they said in 18 months or something like that. Wow. 18 months. And you know, so hearing all of that, my mom was an usher. And I know that they used to use three days to count offerings. Because the biggest domination was 15 naira. So I, 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 you can't convince me of lack in ministry. You can't. I've never had that picture. So I, 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 I don't see any other way, you know, but to, you know. And then um, Pastor Chris, the, the touch of excellence, elocution and delivery, the flow of the supernatural, uh, that's, that's my stream. That's my stream. Who so, do you lean towards the most by my accent? <laughs> <laughs> FFA <laughs> Uh, they are both to be blessed to my life. <laughs> you know, so let me say, ah, it's hard. It's hard to say. But in terms of doctrinal persuasion, maybe more towards pastor. But interestingly, God used both of them as a crucible for me to find my own self. So if you check, um, I'm unique, even in doctrine. Yes. There are many things I hold dear to doctrinally. Yes. That is very different from yeah. the two people that God has used, you know. So, so, but when you talk about the raw spirit of faith, you just start something, do something, plant this church, do it. That's Bishop Oedipo. Raw. Oh, can we celebrate Apostle? Just for us to close. If there's anything that when you look at ministers, you wish you could tell them, but you just want to hold back. If there's anything like that that you'd like to communicate, we'd we'll be glad to hear it. I 
I think I'll start with the first and most important thing. As a young I went to see older minister. This was 2012. And he asked me, what are you preaching in your church currently? And I said, evangelism. And he looked at me like evangelism. Like, seriously? Because um, he has like a raw motivation and prosperity gospel leaning. I believe that God blesses, but I believe that the church is the bedrock of doctrine. And we are in a generation that is questioning everything. And so we need answers. You know, the, um, many Pentecostal churches, for instance, don't have a teaching on tongues, but they, t but they speak in but tongues. They speak in tongues. <laughs> so there is no explanation, no dutiful explanation. And all those kind of things, you must, um, every ministry must have the discipline not to rely on other ministries to do the teaching for them. Yes. So even some of, some of us, we are used to growing up and you go to church, but you augment with Kenetegin books. Isn't that true? Um, but the church is supposed to be the household of truth and the bedrock of doctrine. That's where doctrinal foundations should be formed. So not just telling them to evangelize, how to evangelize, to whom they must evangelize. When you see a Muslim, what are the questions they will have? We'll have. What are the answers? What about Seventh-day Adventists? What? So we have... A curriculum so broad. A curriculum. Yes, a curriculum so broad, so specific, and that position does. It protected us. It protected us. So, for instance, there is almost nothing that anybody will come out and say, because we've had people like that that shook the body of Christ, that we've not taught on decisively years before. Wow. So, so the, my goal as a teacher is to get there first. Because you are better ignorant than misinformed. So, so you want to make sure that, respectfully, one, OAP does not say something, mm. then you now have to start doing damage control. Doctrines that you never bothered to teach on. So, we, we, um, even if I have a simple pattern of teaching, I read all those hard books, I crystallize it into a simple way, break it down for the people, specific tenets. So we have um, a book first and foremost, Am I Being Fooled, for instance. Mm. How do you know Jesus is the way? Mm. Those are questions that if you ask your parents, they may slap you. How do you know the Bible is the word of God? We are living in a generation that is not afraid to ask questions, and you better have the answers. Our parents will say, Jesus is the way, don't ask me. Mm. It won't work. Yes. So I think that at the core of everything people know Celebration Church for, is doctrine, and do not think you can do ministry in the 21st century without answering those questions. It won't work sustainably. Wow. Can we please be upstanding as we honor and celebrate Apostle Emmanuel Hiren for this amazing time. Amen, amen, amen. What an amazing time we've had. Have you been blessed? Are you sure you've been blessed? All right.